um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, 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 good afternoon or good morning, depending on <laughs> the time zone you are. And I'm, I'm Xavier Pasco, so I'm the director of the uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique, the FRS. And I'm, I'm very happy uh, to welcome you all uh, for this new edition of the annual conference on, of our programs devoted to uh, foster and develop the dialogue between Japan and France. Uh, and again, by the way, I would like to reiterate my sincere thanks to our Japanese partners and colleagues to help support this uh, important discussions uh, uh, each time. Um, so I used to say, and you know that, Valérie, that uh, uh, one of the key features of this dialogue and, and uh, even one of the key results of our ex multiple exchanges has been to realize that France and Japan uh, are facing similar challenges today. And that are certainly not confined to regional um, analysis and perspectives. And I think uh, that we can be particularly proud of the fact that this dialogue got really focused on cross views and exchanges between uh, uh, researchers, French and Japanese researchers with French and Japanese and French analysis of today developing situations with strategic consequences worldwide. And so our conference uh, uh, today is no exception to this uh, implicit <laughs> principle, I would say, as we're going to address the topics of the global south for both what it means for both Japan and France. Um, obviously, I'm not a specialist, but this uh, we all know that this concept has, has gained currency uh, in the recent years. Um, and it's the fact that it has gained this kind of uh, 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 Traction, I would say, is in itself a vivid proof that the rising stakes in the South uh, develop in such a way that we, it can hardly be addressed with a segmented or segmented approaches in mind. Uh, whether we're talking about the dynamic and kind of at work in South Asia, in, in, in Africa, of course, it's become very clear uh, that these dynamics are multifaceted and reflect a complex set of roots and causes. Uh, linked to history, but also linked to present tensions and opportunities. So it would certainly be illusory, in my view, uh, uh, to use this global South concept as artificially drawing a kind of line or border between the South and the North. Um, um, uh, and we see how much the development in the Northern Hemisphere uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of a direct or indirect effects on the course of events in many uh, Southern <laughs> countries. But at the same time, the local dynamics uh, obviously a key variable in, in, the, in this equation. Uh, but as I said, obviously, um, um, the well-known activism of some well-known states, uh, are sometimes newcomers in those regions, or sometimes countries returning uh, to the region after years of diplomatic or economic retreat, has added to this complexity. Uh, but it would also be, in my view, unfair to hide uh, behind these uh, developments to prevent our own countries from fully understanding the local and regional dynamics, which clearly are becoming determining factor in the in the self perception of the of this global south. Um, <clears throat> of course, I won't dig uh, deeper into this. I, again, I'm not a specialist myself, and we have the real experts. Uh, of these issues in our three next round table. And, and I realized that uh, uh, we have the fascinating exchanges certainly on this. Unfortunately, myself, I won't be able, as you know, Valérie, to stay for long. Uh, we have to, to leave the meeting and I, I would have loved uh, staying and, and, and be able to uh, uh, listen to this presentation <coughs> and, 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 and listen to the exchanges. Uh, but I'm sure this exchange is going to be intense and very fruitful. I, I, and, 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 and I thank again all the participants uh, for their willingness to address this important issue. Um, so thank you. Um, again, it was just for me, uh, it's a, these are very important issues. Uh, FRS is really uh, very much eager to uh, invest in these areas. And, and now, uh, Valérie, I hand it over to you and uh, for the real start of the discussions. So thank you, thank you, Valérie. And I wish you a, a very fruitful uh, exchanges.
Thank you, Xavier. And yes, I understand that you, you had a very busy schedule and uh, maybe you can watch on YouTube uh, because <laughs> yes, <I will> <laughs> the debate will be available to yeah. all participants and others on uh, YouTube as uh, usual. Uh, so thank you to all of you, of course, um, speakers, but also uh, the participants uh, to this web conference. It will be a three hours uh, web conference with three round tables uh, finishing at uh, 12 uh, French time. And um, the first round table will be focusing on the concept of global south. The second one on the issue of shared values and particularly with a presentation by Ambassador Ishii uh, relationship with uh, um, ASEAN, between Japan and ASEAN, but also more broadly a comment by Klaus Weiler on, the, on this concept of shared value as understood uh, from the European point of view. And then the third roundtable is also very important because it will be focusing on a subject of interest both to Japan and France, of course, on European Union, which is a situation in Africa with uh, two excellent present presenters from uh, Japan and uh, France. Um, um, as you may have noticed, um, the first keep, uh, Japanese speaker for the first round table is, alas, unable to participate, in, uh, to participate and he just told me yesterday. So I'm not Japanese, uh, but I will try in order to introduce this uh, round table, I will try to make uh, a brief presentation of what is in my understanding Japan's position regarding uh, that concept of the global South. Uh, first, interesting uh, enough, but if it is very often the case uh, in Japan, uh, global South in Japanese is Global South. So it's uh, the, the, the English concept that is uh, directly uh, transliterated into Japanese. There, are no, there is no pure Japanese. There are no words in Japanese to, to mention the Global South. Uh, in terms of um, definition for Japan, but not only for Japan, it, uh, Global South is made of I quote, uh, non-aligned or neutral emerging and developing countries, nor related directly to advanced democratic countries, neither to authoritarian regimes. So it's very much related to the old concept or notion of non-aligned uh, that Japan uh, is uh, stressing. Uh, when Japan mentions the advanced democratic countries, uh, it's, in its views, it's uh, related to the G7, uh, which is a rather narrow um, interpretation and authoritarian regime go back, go to uh, China and Russia. And so immediately uh, we see that the geopolitical uh, dimension is very important. And uh, again, for the global South countries as perceived by Japan, these countries want to secure their interest in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so for Japan also, the economic factor is important. Uh, analysis by Japanese experts mentioned that the share of GDP of the global South today, countries today, which is a very broad um, uh, uh, description, is about 20% of the global GDP. And Japan also mentions the fact that the global south will soon be uh, a center for production and consumption with the rise of uh, an important middle class in countries like China, of course, but also India, for instance, and other countries, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in what is the global uh, south. So as I said, the, this economic factor is essential for Japan as well as a better necessity uh, to, as I quote again, Japanese analysts, to better contribute in solving issues concerning development, climate changes, global issues like cli climate change, and the consequences on the global South countries, directly vulnerable to these threats, but also energy and food security and health issues, particularly after the COVID. 
The, the objective uh, proclaimed by Japan is to increase uh, stability and security across what is a global south. And the second factor, perhaps also the most important actually behind the economy is more, much more geostrategic, particularly in the Indo-Pacific for Japan, where uh, Tokyo faces China's ambitions to assert its objectives, change the status quo using force or coercion, sorry, and increase its influence through um, uh, instruments like the Belt and Road Initiative, trade, and uh, the change of norms. And this, of course, uh, is related uh, with the second uh, aspect sorry, of the objective for Japan, which is to develop its uh, relations with what is sometimes perceived as more vulnerable countries of the global south in the framework of uh, what has been launched in March 20, 2023, the plan for the new plan for free and open Indo Pacific that Japan launched in March 2023. And it was also relations with the global south, the focus of the Hiroshima summit in May 2023. Uh, the objective is to make, to work with the global south to help these countries to become more prosperous and democratic, more open and more transparent, leading again to a more stable and secure environment at the global level, but also for Japan in its region, and particularly the Indo-Pacific region. Japan has been very active, launching quality infrastructure initiatives, developing its relations with ASEAN, particularly countries, and India, uh, India, a strategic partner in the Quad, but also with Africa, with the TICAD, Tokyo International Conferences for African Development, uh, organized uh, for a long time now, and with the Pacific Islands countries, with the PALM, Pacific Islands countries meeting. In both cases, the idea is also to offer a counter model or an alternative model to China's strong initiatives. Uh, stressing uh, for Japan human security, avoiding bad debt traps, economic coercion, insisting on the importance of transparency and following the principle of the FOIP as a commitment to the global south, defending also the rule of law, particularly for vulnerable uh, countries, uh, the non-use of force, the freedom of navigation, freedom of trade, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, and non-use of force uh, to, to, to change uh, the status quo according to the principles of the United Nations. At the same time, and this is an important point, en même temps, as we would say in French, Japan also stresses a necessary respect for diversity and inclusiveness refusing to exclude specific countries and does not want to impose its values or the West values on others. Japan pays attention to the different values, historical and cultural backgrounds of these countries. And the objective is to gradually gain the support of these countries and maybe most important for Japan, avoiding through exclusion that these countries side too closely with authoritarian regimes, Russia, of course, but also uh, with the issue of the Ukraine war, for instance, but most importantly for Japan in its own geostrategic environment with China. In order to achieve these objectives, Japan wants to play a positive role and constructive in the global south in partnership with countries, with the region, of course, within this broad uh, region, uh, but also in the framework of other format like the G20 and in cooperation with like-minded countries, another important con concept for Japan, including uh, with France, of course, and the European Union. So this is a very short presentation of what, in my view, is Japan's attitude and position and interest in dealing with the global south. So now, maybe uh, after this uh, short opening, uh, Manuel, I will leave the floor to you.
to uh, present uh, what uh, France and the European Union and yourself, of course, is your analysis concerning that concept. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valérie. Uh, good morning or good evening to everyone. So I am Manuel Lafon-Ravneau. I am the head of the Center for Analysis, Planning and Strategy of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's the, the policy planning staff. Uh, first, I wanted to apologize for not having a Japanese counterpart. Valérie did uh, uh, best to uh, try to represent uh, the Japanese views, but I hope we can get some Franco-Japanese exchange nonetheless with the audience engaging in the in the following discussion. And second, I'm, I'm indeed the, the head of the policy planning at the French MFA. And if you are familiar with policy planning staff, you will know that I'm uh, about to say, uh, what I'm about to say does not necessarily reflect uh, French official thinking, since the role of policy planning is to contribute to uh, strategic thinkings, uh, not to go by talking points. Um, on the issue of uh, uh, the relevance of the concept of uh, Global South, um, two of the reasons why I usually refrain from using the concept too much um, uh, I, I will mention two of these reasons, and they relate precisely, uh, precisely to its globalizing dimension. The first thing is in analytic, analytical terms. It puts in one basket um, a very different and diverse set of countries. Uh, and it's not just that there is diversity in this group, but it's also that this diversity translates into very different needs and very different expectations. If you think of emerging powers, they are looking for international status. If you think of middle-income countries, they are trying to strengthen their prosperity and avoid the famous middle-income trap. Uh, if you think of least developed countries, some of them may give their priority to fighting poverty. Fragile countries need stability. Vulnerable countries prioritize the response to climate change, which is usually the most existential threat to their very existence, et cetera. So if you want to engage with this group, that means that you have very different doors of entry for each of uh, each members of these groups. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that uh, Africa or Latin America or the Middle East or Asia uh, also mean uh, a lot of differences. The second uh, reason I want to mention this morning is uh, more in geopolitical terms. Um, is It's that um, I, I'm not totally convinced that it's a good policy to uh, give uh, some countries um, um, a boon in their attempt to uh, posture themselves, position themselves as the spokesperson of this group. Um, the, most of the time, the way we talk of the Global South actually easily deprive many of the countries people think of when we use the term uh, of their agency. Because when we discuss the idea of engaging, for instance, the Global South, we usually think of engaging key players, emerging powers, swing states, or regional leaders. And uh, not only does it uh, put on the side uh, partners and stakeholders that we need to work with, for instance, in climate, everybody knows now, I hope, uh, that uh, if you talk to uh, small uh, insular developing uh, states, you have a very different perspective than if you talk to oil producing uh, uh, countries. Um, but not only does it, uh, do you have this uh, issue of actually uh, obscuring parts of the group, but also you give a hand to those who claim to be spokesperson for this group of countries. And it helps some of these uh, countries to weaponize in a way the presumed voice of the global South for their own great power purpose or even a revisionist purpose. Um, the, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, Catherine Colonna, is on the record uh, uh, to say that there is, uh, she says, there is not just one global south. We need to uh, be mindful of this diversity and take it seriously. Now, as, as a policy planner, I'm also an observer of the global discussion and there are many reasons why people nonetheless use these concepts uh, and why there's no easy uh, substitute. Uh, there's no easy substitute because uh, uh, any uh, uh, comprehensive approach of the issue that I'm going to mention ends up with having this kind of globalizing perspective. So uh, I actually rather say so-called global south than talk about the rest, as in the West versus the rest, which I think is even worse in terms of uh, uh, framing uh, uh, the issue. But the, the issue in terms of substance is that 
there is a sense that's uh, among the, 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 the uh, nations in the world, there is a sense that the distribution of power is shifting, that there is room, but not just room, there is also need for a more balanced world order, a more balanced global governance. And that's the North needs to come to terms with the fact that uh, uh, there is something which is perceived as its monopoly on power and the global order, and that this needs to change. And that was already the case of that, that was already what was uh, uh, suggested with this idea of the West uh, versus the rest. It was actually, what do we do with the so-called, uh, at the time, uh, de-Westernization uh, of the world? Um, and so there is something in common between these two conceptual descriptions of global dynamics, which have to do with the common reivindication there. Now, I'm not saying that the global South is a politically consistent group. I don't think that's the case. At best, on top of this common reivindication, which uh, takes many different shapes, there's a temptation to play as a negative majority by some uh, countries, not all of them. The BRICS countries, for instance, we've talked a lot about the BRICS, and sometimes uh, it feels that people believe BRICS and Global South are uh, uh, almost equivalent, which clearly is not the case. But even if you just look at the BRICS uh, as a group, actually these countries don't actually agree on much. In any case, it depends on what they would agree on. Nonetheless, a few things on which they would agree, which is what they would like to change. I'm not sure they agree on which change they would like to see, but they agree that they would like to see change in global governance. And the risk of ignoring uh, this kind of uh, uh, systemic issue for the world order um, is to give substance to the narrative that the North, the global North, uh, if there is such a thing, is not interested in fighting poverty, in tackling hunger, or in addressing regional uh, conflicts. And so since the issue today is uh, what do we do with engaging the global South, I think that if you follow this analysis, there are three points that come uh, in terms of en engagement as a consequences of, uh, of this. The first is that um, the concept, as uh, Xavier was saying, has made a uh, uh, comeback uh, uh, on the forefront of the international discussion in the context of the war against Ukraine. Well, it's important to note that the various votes uh, that have taken place at the UN do not confirm that there is such a uh, north-south uh, divide. There is a significant majority of member states, including a big number of south country, uh, that believe, and have voted accordingly, that believe that Russia has violated the UN Charter, that condemned the war, and, and this majority is a broad reflection of the diversity of the membership, big powers, small powers, developing countries, vulnerable countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if some powers use the idea of the global south to push for a revisionist agenda, as I've mentioned, there is the vast majority of the membership that does not want to give up on key principles that are reflected uh, in the UN Charter, like sovereign equality, prohibition uh, of the use of force, territorial integrity, and non-interference. What they want is not to put these key principles uh, in question. What they want is to be reassured on our commitments behind these principles. The second point is that if we want to give this kind of reassurance, the proof of the pudding will be in our ability to address these countries' expectations and needs. And COVID uh, has reinforced the feeling uh, that the developing world, um, uh, that the developed world, so, so sorry, the developed economies might not be serious on their commitments. Um, one of the big issue of the uh, UN General Assembly uh, high level uh, segment, which took place uh, last week, was about the sustainable development goals. And if you look at them, well, it was not a brilliant situation before COVID, and with COVID, we've actually uh, 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 have backtracked. Uh, uh, what do we do with that? That was one of the key questions, and I'm not sure uh, a majority of the membership was reassured by what we said uh, uh, last week, collectively. And moreover, there is a growing suspicion that uh, developed countries uh, are interested in a my country first approach on issues like trade, on issues like security of supply, on energy, of food, of vaccines, etc., cetera. Um, and addressing these concerns was a key motive, for instance, for the summit for a new financial pact, which was convened in Paris by President Macron uh, last June, uh, 
which is a summit where we insisted that uh, you cannot force countries on having to choose between fighting poverty and protecting the planet in terms of uh, uh, environment and climate change, and that we need uh, to do much more uh, financial effort to allow for that uh, uh, choice, uh, this, that kind of arbitration, not to have to be made by developing countries. And it's not just more money, it's also a change in the financial architecture. That is not to say that this is all about money, but that's a significant part of the issue seen from these countries of the so-called global south. And third, as I have just hinted, um, there is an issue of a reform of the global architecture, multilateral reform, if you will. Um, there is a revisionist agenda behind uh, some of the global south rhetoric, but pushing back against this uh, uh, rhetoric does not mean that we need to be a force for the status quo in the multilateral uh, arena. On the contrary, we need to embrace the need for reform. I think it's really good that the G20 decided to include the African Union. I think we need to expand the UN Security Council, and that's a topic on which China and Russia are trying to disguise their reluctance, but they are the ones who are reluctant. I don't think France or Japan, for that matter, are reluctant at all on the topic. On the contrary, we also need to reform the Bretton Woods institutions. And it's not just about institutional reforms, even though that's an important bit, but it's also about reforming multilateral public policies. If you reform the Bretton Woods institution, you also need to come with a, a successor to the so-called Washington Consensus. What do we do with debt relief? What do we do with financing for climate, for financing for energy transition? And it's not just about finance and Bretton Woods issues. It's also about biodiversity, about tech regulation, about digital governance, about food security, about conflict resolution. These are among key issues for such an effort. As a conclusion, I think we live in a world where diversification and not just economic diversification, but geopolitical diversification uh, and transactionalism is the name of the game. And we need to stick to a strategy where uh, uh, that, that values partnerships and solidarity and not just uh, short-term transaction and uh, multi-alignment as, as some of the uh, uh, global South powers have uh, tried to uh, theorize. Countries like France and Japan, who again insist on UN security reform, who are also among the four largest um, um, public development assistance providers and uh, have many more uh, points in common, share so much on these issues, are important players to step up to this challenge, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Manuel, for this uh, very rich and uh, interesting uh, and uh, presentation. Um, as uh, you know, uh, I will moderate uh, the questions. And um, please, if you have any questions, uh, I hope you have, I mean, in order to launch the debate, you can use the Q on air button that you have at the bottom of your screen. And then I will relay these questions. Uh, I know by experience that very often people uh, start to react just five minutes before the end of the round table, which is uh, quite complicated uh, for the organizers and uh, maybe it can lead to frustrations because we do not have time to take all the questions. So please do not hesitate uh, to put your questions with the cue on our button. Meanwhile, um, it's it was a very broad and interesting presentation on, on the Global South, uh, Manuel. And uh, this is true also that we, we see a, a kind of comeback under new names of a very old uh, notion that has been uh, used and uh, exploited in a way by some countries like China, for instance, for uh, decades. Uh, so there is a, a dis difference between interest of the global South countries, the diversity that you mentioned, the fact that uh, there are very few points in common between some of these countries, the fact also that the some of the countries included in the global south also want to use it in order to 
uh, increase their own uh, influence. Um, and I remember, I'm old enough for that, to, that uh, under Maoist time in China, I mean, there was, there was a concept of the three worlds and uh, what was called at that time and what was uh, used in China as a, uh, terrain for uh, increasing its influence vis-à-vis -vis the West, but also at that time vis-à-vis -vis the Soviet Union, was the le troisième monde, the third world, of course, uh, which is very close to what we uh, describe or perceive today as being that thing which is called the global south, whatever is uh, included. Uh, so maybe we could debate a little bit more about this renewal uh, of a, an old uh, concept, an old situation, and always related to uh, the fact that some countries uh, need to use that concept in order to increase their influence on the global scene vis-a-vis -vis the West. Uh, and this is what leads mostly the debate more than uh, there are, of course, issues related to development, as you mentioned, the role that we can play um, at the global level. But there is also that constant of opposition where uh, that concept is used in order to gain uh, traction. And the second point may be uh, more um, specific that you could develop a little bit if you, if you want. <laughs> Sorry is uh, relations of France with the Pacific Island countries. Uh, we, we all know that uh, Japan, uh, France sorry, has strong interest in the region. And what is very interesting is that Japan also is very, <laughs> sorry, I, has a lot of expect, expectancy regarding this region. And again, it started again because of J China's offensive. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am also out of COVID, and as you can see. And um, so the role of China in the region led to renewed interest of countries like Japan. Of course, France has direct interest in the region, but also other countries in the Pacific. So if you can please tackle these two questions. <laughs> yes, I will take over to let you uh, recover from uh, COVID, Valérie. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, two, two quick reactions on what you say. Uh, yes, of course, uh, this discussion about uh, Global South is uh, in a way uh, reframing of a very old uh, discussion. What is interested is precisely that the idea of third world uh, was uh, 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 emerged in the context of a bipolar uh, order. And there's a lot of discussion these days about uh, bipolar order re-emerging. I'm not sure that's the case, but there's a lot of discussion about that. But nonetheless, the idea is not that the global source would be a third world. It is that it would be part of the second uh, world or the first world, that there is this uh, uh, very strange to me uh, 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 idea, implicit often idea, that China and Russia, even Russia, would be part of the global south, which really doesn't make uh, uh, any sense uh, in many ways. Um, and, and this idea of uh, uh, having this kind of, the global south is basically everybody else but the west or the global north, uh, um, the collective west, as the Russian says these days, or the global north, um, very much plays into a block-to-block -block logic. Uh, which I think is part of the trap of framing the issues in terms of in, in taking uh, 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 too seriously the, the globalizing uh, uh, implications of the idea of the of the global uh, south, which does play into this idea of a block to block uh, logic. And the, the reality is that there is no block to block logic. Um, and your second point on uh, uh, countries in the Pacific, especially small insular states, uh, precisely is a very good example of the fact that not only there is not uh, such block-to-block -block logic, but actually a lot of the countries uh, among the so-called global south, for instance, the insular uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific, don't want to be trapped into a either-or logic. They don't want to be trapped into having to make a choice 
between either China or the US. They want to be able to uh, keep their options open. They want to be able to take advantage of uh, what uh, the Chinese economy bring to them. Um, and even if we were to uh, step up our development assistance, our infrastructure strategy with global gateway, et cetera, our uh, financial assistance, our debt relief policy, et cetera, they would still be tempted to also uh, benefit from what uh, the Chinese are offering them in terms of technology access, in terms of market access, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's what I meant when I said there is this diversification trend uh, in uh, international relations these days. So they don't want to be trapped in an either or, which means also that because they access uh, the Chinese market or Chinese technology, they don't want to be trapped through that access into having to align politically and be dependent in terms of security of China. And, and they don't want to be dependent on uh, the US uh, either. And part of what the EU policy is about and part of what the French uh, policy is about, and I think that uh, the Japanese play also into uh, the same direction, is to be able to offer actually additional options to these countries. It's easier to, uh, uh, because obviously if you're an insular country in the Pacific, you don't want to have to make a choice between aligning either on China or on the US, but every time you make a choice for one, the others tell you, I've seen what you just did. Um, the Chinese especially obviously uh, come and insist that hmm, they've noted that and they're not sure that's propitious to the rest of the cooperation. The US has a clear explicit uh, uh, foreign policy discourse where they say they don't want to force countries into a, a, a binary uh, choice. One of the way to make that easier is that precisely you don't have the choice between only two options. Uh, and the EU is another option, Japan is another option, and other countries uh, can be part uh, of, of that too. Uh, we are cooperating, for instance, in the Indo-Pacific with uh, the Emirates and India uh, quite uh, strongly. Uh, we are working with uh, Australia also, but also part of what we are doing with uh, Japan bilaterally or through uh, frameworks like the G7, for instance, uh, precisely is to see how we can have these kinds of uh, options that are uh, helping these countries to make choices freely, to have to not just have formal sovereignty, but have actually substantive sovereignty, to have an actual freedom in the exercise of their sovereignty in choosing different options in terms of uh, uh, their trade partner, their technology provider, their uh, uh, partner for cooperation in uh, addressing climate change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in that context, it is important to respond to the priorities of these countries. And when you go to uh, uh, big conferences on uh, security issues and big power competition in the Pacific, and that was the case again in New York last week, I was at a small insular uh, 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 Indian Ocean and Pacific uh, Ocean Forum. Most of the leaders of the region who uh, took the floor there, there insisted that their concern was climate change and development. And that's where they are expecting uh, support from our part. I, I hope this answers your questions, Valérie. Thank you, Manuel. Yes, it does. And it opens also new uh, questions for debate. I strongly, um, again, ask the participants of, uh, to, to, to maybe jump in in order to, to ask questions or make comments. I see there are many people uh, in, uh, in the room, who, uh, the virtual room, who, who could do, do that. So it would be nice to be able to have a more broad, a broader dialogue on this. Um, you mentioned the fact that many countries do not want to uh, to be trapped into a binary relationship, or I mean, to side with one block against another block, and that, that there are indeed no not two blocks. This is completely true. This is parti particularly true, as you mentioned, uh, with countries in ASEAN, uh, in uh, the, at, the, at the heart of this uh, broader region of the Indo-Pacific, where uh, ASEAN countries, of course, uh, cannot um, 
I mean, decouple, uh, this is uh, uh, from China, uh, where the trade relationship between the two is so important. By the way, I just want to make a small remark. Many people do not know, for instance, but indeed, when you look in terms of trade, uh, China is the first partner of the countries of this, re of this region and other region. But when you look into investments, the EU is, I think, one of the first uh, in terms of investments in the region in Southeast Asia, Japan also, of course, but also the US. So when you look at, and, uh, this is also true in terms of development aid. So when you look at what is really done in these regions, you have the image of a China dominating at China, playing a major role in the economies of this region where you cannot achieve I mean, you cannot expect this region to side against China because if this is such an opportunity, <clears throat> but also at the same time, uh, it is often forgotten that uh, very important players are also the EU first, but also US and Japan. <clears throat> but this is something that people do forget completely because they just focus at trade figures and China looks and present itself, of course, project itself as the main player in the region in economic terms, whereas we play a major role. So in terms of communication, I think we have efforts to make, being Japan or EU, to <clears throat> make people better understand the role we play in the region, which is already extremely important. Uh, so just as we don't know, I mean, we are a little bit far from our subject, but just far, just as we do not realize that when we, when we speak of foreign investments in China itself, uh, it's, it's very often, it's very much Chinese investments coming either from, um, you know, re- invested in China after being uh, money outside of China being reinvested in China or coming from Taiwan or from uh, China, overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, for instance. It, this is the vast majority of investments in China, more than 80%. And the West uh, is only uh, a very low level of investments actually in the global economy of China. So these figures help to uh, reconsider uh, different interest and different engagement uh, in a very important uh, uh, region. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, when you mentioned the, that very, there are no blocks, I mean, to, to not to accept the idea that there is a, a block competition. Uh, the problem is that for countries like China, for instance, uh, in its own region, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, vis-a-vis -vis South Korea and other countries in the region, indeed, China itself has, I mean, China's perception and analysis of the global situation is a confrontation between two blocks. And uh, it is also playing, this is also why China is uh, investing so much in trying to win um, other countries in the global south uh, as a way to uh, reinforce its own margin of van maneuver and win uh, support from countries against the West, mostly against led by the United States. So it's quite complicated sometimes to play our own role vis-a-vis -vis a country, China, in uh, the Indo-Pacific, that is framing itself completely in terms of uh, opposition between uh, two blocks. I don't know if you have comment on this, okay. as we still do not have any questions from the floor. <laughs> I, I agree with what you just said, Valérie, and I think that it's precisely why it's important uh, first to be able to frame the situation differently than in binary terms. The fact that this is the Chinese perception doesn't mean that it has to be the reality and doesn't mean that it has to be the way the rest of, for instance, uh, uh, the Asia-Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific uh, countries sees the issue. And I, as you said, I don't think uh, that's the case uh, for the time uh, being. Uh, and I think we need to make sure that we uh, play into this kind of different uh, uh, perception and uh, not just in terms of narrative, but also in terms of what we put into place and the way we create partnerships and uh, build solidarity with uh, countries uh, in this uh, region. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, 
That's also why it's important, and, and that's a key uh, motto of the uh, uh, EU policy on China and of the French policy on China. It's important to make crystal clear that our strategy is not to uh, uh, only stick to uh, the competitive parts of the relationship with uh, China. As you know uh, all very well, I think everybody on this webinar knows that the EU has this trilogy of uh, competition uh, on, in uh, economic terms, um, systemic rivalry, but also partnership and cooperation. And there are issues on which cooperation by China is needed and issues on which uh, cooperation with China is possible. One of the uh, uh, big aspects of uh, what we uh, tried and achieved with the summit for a new financial pact uh, in June in Paris precisely was to bring China in, for instance, because of the debt relief issue. So far, China is very reluctant to go and play uh, uh, the collective game of debt relief. They don't agree with some of the rules that have been agrees, uh, agreed in the Paris Club, and they uh, argue that uh, uh, OECD country, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, should bear the burden of debt relief. And well, we've done that in the past, and we know that that has played a key role in uh, uh, China's ability to become a very good lender uh, to a lot of developing countries, sometimes in situations that have not made this uh, country's financial situation uh, really better. One of the agreements that was uh, uh, that came to fruition uh, in the sidelines of the summit was an agreement on debt relief of Zambia, which is an African country, which was uh, precisely very, very uh, much indebted uh, to China. Uh, and so if you are able to bring China into playing a more collective game on debt relief issue or on climate, for instance, which is another obvious uh, uh, issue on which uh, uh, the issue is not whether China is willing to please the West or the North or whatever to cooperate, but is whether China is willing to address the issue, which is very much a threat to its own uh, uh, situation uh, on a national basis, uh, to its own future in a way. Um, if we are able to cooperate, then obviously it's more complicated for China to frame the issue in very binary terms. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Uh, of course, one of the main uh, advantage in a way, and I, in, by saying that, I may be a little bit cynical uh, of China in increasing its influence on all uh, in countries of the global south, to, be, uh, to use that term, is its uh, tremendous um, economic uh, capacity to pour money without paying attention, as you just said, to questions of uh, debt and um, as a way to influence its uh, policy and without any respect for transparency, for instance. And this is an issue that uh, Japan is focusing on, as we do in the European Union. And this is also what was an advantage, uh, because China arrived with this capacity to pour money supporting regimes um, when just at the time when the West uh, or Europe, for instance, was not so much focused on uh, maintaining its influence after the end of the Cold War, for instance. So, um, and, you know, to, to imposing its values uh, to countries that could just turn uh, with the delusion that it would be a long term solution to China. Uh, that provided an alternative to support that was much more difficult to obtain uh, with uh, well, people's pay of conditionality or whatever. People very often mention that China has no conditions for its uh, development aid. Actually, it has conditions, and one of them being relationship with Taiwan, for instance, even though there were some evolution on this issue too. So uh, a lot of things to debate, including with Japan. And I have one question. Uh, maybe that's too bad that we have no uh, Japanese speakers because it's quite difficult to answer that question without a Japanese speaker. But the question I quote is, is I believe Japan and Great Britain have been strengthening their ties, ties recently, this is true. To what extent are these rapprochements mostly bilateral, France, Japan, UK, Japan, or is there room for trilateralism here? Thank you. Uh, 
considering the fact that uh, the UK now is not part of the EU anymore. So can you imagine a kind of trilateral cooperation between Japan, UK, and um, France? Um, there is there is indeed room for trilateral uh, formats. This is what is happening right now is not just mostly bilateral. What is happening at the bilateral level is feeding into minilateral formats, <clears throat> and that's the case uh, for everyone and everywhere. Uh, the most visible aspect of that is what the uh, U.S. has been pushing for with the Quad, with Japan, Australia, and India. But we have our own uh, 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 trilateral or minilateral uh, formats of discussions. I mentioned the one with um, 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 the Emirates and India. We had uh, uh, in the past discussions with uh, Australia and Japan or with India and Japan. Uh, and as you said, uh, the UK is a particular case because of Brexit, but there is indeed already in the framework of the EU strategy towards the Indo-Pacific, a lot of cooperation that is not just bilateral, but that is not just the EU on the issue with, which are uh, uh, where there is EU uh, competence, but there is a lot of cooperation also with member states in the framework of the collective EU strategy, for instance, uh, uh, in the fight against uh, illegal fishing, uh, where not everybody is able to deploy uh, assets in the region, but there is indeed some kind of coordination with what the EU does as such, what some member states, uh, EU member states do uh, on an individual basis and what some states of the region do. And uh, I mentioned illegal fishing because I know that's uh, a big uh, uh, area uh, for development of cooperation, especially uh, uh, with Japan and uh, with regard to some of the countries in the uh, both in the Pacific and the uh, um, um, Indian Ocean region. And uh, if, if not everybody on the webinar is aware, illegal fishing is not just about uh, uh, managing natural resources or uh, protecting biodiversity, but actually a lot of what happens behind uh, or through uh, illegal fishing is very geopolitical in terms of reclaiming uh, territorial seas, uh, control uh, of some maritime areas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's, that's a very good example of cooperation, which certainly is not going to remain at the bi bilateral stage. Then cooperation with the UK was, I think, uh, uh, specifically was, I think, uh, a bit more complicated until recently because of the UK insisting that it didn't want to do uh, uh, pretty much anything with the EU as such. And when you cooperate uh, uh, with us uh, on some of the key issues, uh, for instance, in the Indo-Pacific region that we are talking about, there is very often a very big aspect of what you do with the EU. If there is more pragmatism from the UK side, as it seems uh, it is now the case, I think that there is indeed prospect for working with the UK in terms of what Europeans do, and not just the EU as such, but the EU and the UK and maybe others uh, working collectively on some of these uh, issues that we've been discussing. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. We still have, uh, we are supposed to have still five minutes, but uh, uh, if not, uh, maybe I will uh, close uh, this session and uh, thank you again for making such an uh, interesting and, uh, you know, stimulating um, presentation and answering my uh, questions and questions from uh, the floor. Um, so maybe we will have five minutes to drink a glass of water or coffee and uh, the second session will start at 10 uh, in five minutes. So don't leave the room, especially the speakers. And uh, we will see you again in five minutes to start the second session of this uh, webinar. Again, thank you to you. Thanks to you, uh, Manuel. Thank you very much. But let me, uh, while you do that, I will introduce a second round table, uh, which is uh, focusing on, um, we have two very Im important and in, uh, 
fascinating uh, speakers, uh, Professor Masafumi Ishi, who is Ambassador Masafumi Ishi from Ambassador to Indonesia, and um, uh, Professor uh, Klaus Wehler, Dr. Klaus Wehler, who is a former uh, Secretary General of the European uh, Parliament and, uh, <laughs> and now at the uh, Martin Center. And uh, so we hope we will have a very good exchange between the two of you. And again, I'm telling, um, I mean, for the floor, please do not hesitate to ask questions or make comments. It uh, makes uh, for a more lively and interesting discussion. Uh, each presentation will be uh, approximately 15 or a little bit more, 15 minutes. And then it will be followed by a Q&A session until uh, 11 a.m. French time, uh, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, Japan time. So, uh, Professor uh, Ishii, uh, you have the floor. You can share the screen with us. You, it's okay. Okay. you can see it. You can see it. Okay, very good. Okay. And you can hear me, right? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry to be late. And uh, I, I didn't have a chance to hear the discussion in the first session, but uh, I think it was more or less about the overall engagement of the Global South. Yes. And uh, I understand the Ophelia son had some reason to skip that. I, I tried so, to replace him, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot replace him, but uh, let me but uh, instead start from the issue of uh, this. What does it mean to engage the Global South? I think, uh, in my mind, there is no country called Global South. There is no group of countries who have the same view or position. So there is no such thing as Global South. And uh, we need to be careful in using that word because it's a perfect uh, way to uh, make to get things appear that there is a confrontation between the global south and global north, which is which does. So I, no wonder that the notion is frequently used by Russians and Chinese. So we need to be careful, and then we shouldn't lose sight about what global south means to us. So engaging the global south means to us is to use a tailored approach. I think each country has a dif different strategic positioning uh, um, and the geographical positioning. So we need to be mindful about uh, where they are, what they need, what we need to do. So I think tailored approach is the first keyword. And the second keyword is uh, prioritize and concentrate. That is to identify, it's not that we engage Global South as a whole. Our objective is to engage some of them to create the uh, important majority in the global scene. So. I think we need to prioritize and concentrate, uh, identify strong and influential countries among global South and prioritize in strengthening strengthen our relations with them. The third uh, keyword is, I think, coordinate and divide responsibilities. I think uh, Japan cannot do it by itself, obviously, neither France, France, and in, even India cannot do it by itself. So I think share that uh, share that the prioritization, the cognition of prioritization and and uh, with allies and like-minded countries and to establish some sort of division of labor among like-minded countries. That's what uh, is needed in engaging global South. Now, I think the background, uh, we need to we need to understand the background. That is, uh, I think so far, um, what, what's going to happen in 20 years time? I think uh, at this time, it's fair to say that US is the only superpower. It's not uh, no, no polar, it's, it's not multipolar situation yet. But I think uh, in 10 years time, sometime in 2030s, I think G3, which is the US and uh, uh, China and India. We all often talk about G2, but I don't think G3 is going to happen. But uh, I think instead G3, India to join will emerge in 2030s. I think US is the only superpower now because their GDP is still 1.5 times more than that of Chinese. Although China will pass the, the size of, in terms of size of GDP of the United States, if the present trend continues by the end of this, uh, this uh, decade. But uh, more importantly, in terms of defense spending, 
U.S. is spending 2.5 times more than, than that of Chinese. And uh, I think U.S. Uh, defense spending is 70% uh, of the global defense spending uh, aggregate. So U.S. is, I think, at this time, the only superpower. But in, sorry, in 20 years or in 10 years, sometime in 2030s, I think three top tier countries, US, China, India will emerge. That's what I call G3. And in terms of GDP and defense spending, China will be more or less in the same size as US. And po but population wise, I think India has already become world well, top population and uh, its population will continue to increase. And China's population has already started decreasing. And uh, I think sometime in 2030s, India's GDP will become more than that of Japan. So India will become number three in terms of GDP size. So that's that's what I call G3. That's number one. Number two is uh, Indonesia and India will be a decisive factor for creating global majority. You know, let's say if we try to create new G7 sometime in 2040s, 20 years time from now, it will look like G3, US, China, India, plus Japan and Indonesia, actually. Indonesia's GDP is supposed to overtake Japan sometime in 2040s. So Japan may be just hanging in there as number five of GDP. I hope we'll be there. And Europe, obviously, if it, it keeps united, and I, I think for that reason, you know that there's no other way but to get united. And Russia, whether you like it or not, I think even after the, the Ukraine crisis ends, Russia is not going to go away. I think they will stay as a negative power and a very difficult power to deal with because they will stick more to their existing privileges like a, like a veto power in Security Council as well as a huge number of nuclear weapons they possess. So it is more or less the same as we are witnessing now in relation to Ukraine war. That is, if something like Ukraine war happens, then I think on the one side, we see US, Japan, and Europe stick together. And on the other side, China and Russia get together. Although they are not uh, seeing eye to eye to each other, they are not the same, exactly the same, but comparatively speaking, they are the other end. So who are left in between is uh, India and Indonesia. These two big guys, uh, I think which side these two big guys are an inch closer will decide the majority, global majority. That's what I think. Now, number three, more related to the main subject of this session, that is Southeast Asia. The fact of division expands amongst ASEAN countries. I think South Asia, Southeast Asia becomes the center of competition over influence among G3, US, China for the time being, and, and sometime in future, India. Because that area is called Indochina, which means historically that is the area where the influence of India and China crashed with each other. So most of the ASEAN countries always say that in public, don't force us to choose. We will never choose between China and the United States. But I think they have already chosen India market. Japanese foreign ministry has been carrying out the opinion poll in the past uh, 15 years or so. And then uh, one of the consistent questions has been, which country are you going to rely on more in future? And uh, there are only three countries among 10 ASEAN countries where um, they, they think Japan will be more important than China, consistent. These are big three, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. These three countries happen to have the three largest uh, populations among us. So big enough to be ready to rely on Japan and the United States in, in at the time of crisis, rather than giving in to the pressure coming from North. And uh, mid-three, Thailand, Malaysia, Myanmar. This is where the result swings between China and Japan and the United States by administration. So these are very important countries, but we need to realize that these countries will not be with you all the time. It's mostly Cambodia, Lao Republic, Brunei. I think uh, where China was uh, was seen as more important than Japan and United States consistent. And uh, I think we, we will help them when, when they need help. 
but uh, I think we cannot expect much coming out of them at the time of crisis. So we have to control our expectations. The last special case is Singapore, where they host US Navy and Air Force since 1990s, but uh, there's a huge number of immigration coming from mainland China, and the business with mainland China has been on the rise. So in my mind, ASEAN has been already chosen uh, where, according to where they stand. This is, uh, this is a chart which shows the, the strengths uh, in terms of the size of GDP and uh, population of the major South, global South countries. Uh, region, it is uh, separated by region, by region. And uh, the left column in the same region is a country which has more than 50, uh, uh, 50 million population. And uh, if you look at this, I, I think the countries in red are G20 members. Countries in blue are, are kind of uh, countries to, difficult to deal with. Let's say noisy countries. Important, but noisy. So I think uh, I have only three or four more minutes, so I shouldn't uh, uh, get out of the mainstream too, too much. But uh, if you look at this, and then think about the choice of new membership of BRICS, you realize that BRICS made a very strange choice. For example, they didn't uh, choose Indonesia. Well, I think Indonesia said no to the invitation. And in Latin America, you know, the, they didn't choose Mexico, they chose uh, Argentina instead. And Middle East, they didn't choose Turkey. Instead, they chose UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran, naturally, yes, but not Turkey. That's very strange. And in Africa, they didn't choose Nigeria, but Egypt and, uh, and uh, Ethiopia, whose GDP is uh, below 60. Although it has a uh, hundred uh, hundred million population, more than hundred million population, so this shows, I think, uh, the, the their choice of new membership was very very strange. So now coming back to the mainstream, how to divide our labor? I, I said keywords, a tailored approach, prioritize and concentrate and coordinate and divide labor. We should first coordinate as soon as possible. Uh, views among the like-minded countries about the following. Who are the priority partners, as I explained? What we need from each one of them and what we should do now to achieve that end. And I think a certain regional division of labor among allies and like-minded countries, I think makes sense. Southeast Asia, Japan has been responsible. Japan will continue to make every effort with a little bit of help coming from, but well, with a very important help coming from Australia. Central Asia, I think India is now very interested in engaging with Central Asian countries uh, as a member of uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization. And the South Pacific, I think in the back, in the backyard of Australia, and the United States is, is re-engaging itself, and plus Japan perhaps. And uh, importantly, Africa and Middle East, Europe has to do more. I know it's difficult. Uh, but uh, I think this is in your backyard, like uh, Southeast Asia is Japan back. Latin America, for the same reason, I think US should step up its effort more than that, more than present. Because so the situation is not going into the right direction in most of the Latin American countries. So this is what I call the regional division of data on allies and like Europe do more for African communities. I know French has been in the forefront in trying to stabilize uh, Africa, but the uh, situation is not very friendly to France in, in the recent years. I understand the situation, but uh, I think there's uh, no better choice than Europe to engage African Middle East. Now, I, I think I, I spend enough time, so I, I will just uh, make a short, brief remarks. About no, please, okay. no, no, you can, you can finish your presentation. We have, we have time. Go on, please. Okay, okay. I think what the Japan, US, and Europe should do. Number one, achieve, well, I think each one of us should become stronger, like Japan is trying to get stronger. 
uh, even Japan is going to spend up to 2% of GDP by 2027. And second, in terms of Japan, in case of Japan, we need to establish further coordination in Japan-US alliance in terms of planning, in terms of uh, command and control, and perhaps with NATO. Number three is the strength. And I think, you know, these two are necessary simply because the relative supremacy of the United States has been in decline, and we cannot stop that. So we have to fill the gap. Although it, we don't really have to change basic framework completely, but uh, which is uh, face with China, with uh, support of the United States as an alliance partner in the heart. You don't have to change that uh, basic uh, framework, in your case, NATO. But I think in order to maintain the, uh, the same amount of uh, deterrence power, I think you, we need to stretch the pillar of that this uh, alliance relationship. That's why Japan has to become stronger. We, we need to have a better coordination between allies. And then these two are not even enough. So we need to strengthen, just to expand the base of our cooperation, we need to strengthen the network among like-minded countries and partners. And uh, I, I think from the viewpoint of Japan, I think core partnership is one. And uh, we will make every effort to expand wherever we have a chance. And I think ROK is a very good candidate to, to be added to what? And strengthen core cooperation with Southeast Asian countries in accordance with the priority acts like you mentioned. And uh, to follow up strategic concept of NATO, I think specify what we can do with Europe. And I think for that purpose, I think opening the NATO's office in Japan is a one step forward. So I hope uh, France will let it go uh, as soon as possible. And, uh, and uh, I think Japan. Based upon the three strategic documents we adopted last year, last December, we have a new tools, two new tools. One is uh, arms provision. We will become a competitor of uh, French uh, French uh, military industries. We will try. And then second uh, new tool is uh, military infrastructure assistance, which we call OSA, Official Security Assistance. Uh, in comparison with uh, with the with the ODA, so now we are able to assist the uh, infrastructure building, which can be used by both civilians and the military uh, forces. So we we are determined to make use of these two new tools to uh, strengthen network among like like countries. Now, under number four. Strengths and deterrence by becoming best prepared. I think this is relevant, uh, particularly with uh, uh, with Taiwan, with uh, efforts to stop Taiwan contingency from happening, and we have a fair chance to do it. And uh, last but not least, this is a very important element that is, with all these efforts behind us, talk to China. I think maintain and strengthen uh, structures of communication with them so that they understand we are best prepared already, for example, in relation to the Taiwan Strait. So if you do go ahead and use military means to reunify Taiwan, uh, you may fail. There's a, there a chance of failure. If China does understand that, I think uh, because Taiwan is so important for the Chinese Communist Party, if they fail, I think the, the source of their legitimacy itself will be destroyed. So they will think twice. if they know clearly that, that they have a chance of failure if they try to do that. And uh, I think, uh, and it is also very important that uh, not only Chinese Communist Party itself, but uh, Xi Jinping himself understands that, uh, that uh, risk. And uh, particularly with Southeast Asia, as I said, well, first, uh, be patient and honor ASEAN initiative. I think uh, this is uh, this will continue to be our main main policy. And uh, as I said, Indonesia said no to the invitation from uh, BRICS. I think one reason is in the eyes of Indonesia, BRICS is too much leaning towards uh, towards the anti Europe, anti Western side. So in terms of balancing, sense of balance, I think they didn't like. 
But at the same time, I, I think simply because ASEAN has been united and everybody is supporting the unity of ASEAN, it was uh, difficult even for a big guy like Indonesia to say goodbye and then join uh, BRICS uh, by itself out of ASEAN country. So from that, that is why I think the unity of ASEAN, uh, ASEAN first is very important to keep the unity among these 10 countries. So we will continue to use that as a main policy. That is not going to change. But number two, at the same time, our resources are limited, so we need to somehow prioritize. So uh, to, be, to be very short, we need, I think our support, our cooperation uh, with the big three, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, will become a little bit more than that of as that to other countries. But we'll never give up uh, uh, mid three to swings, and we will support small three when important. So I think we need to be careful in prioritization. Uh, I think if it's too big, I think this is like a, a working against the main policy that is to support the unity of ASEAN. If it's too small, it's not going to be realized. So I think it has to be big, big enough to be realized, but small enough to be ignored. It's a very difficult diplomatic uh, thing we need to do. And last but not least, get us more engaged in tangible way. And uh, get, sorry, not us, get US, sorry, get US more engaged in a tangible way in Southeast Asia. And what they say, uh, what they do matters more than what they say. And uh, I think presence is, military presence is very good, exercise is big, but I think uh, it needs, the engagement needs to have an element of economic engagement. And in that viewpoint, IPF is a very good start, but not enough. I think without the market access element, Southeast Asia will never take US conduct seriously. We've been telling this in actually a, every meeting we have with Americans. Uh, so the lecturing to Americans uh, makes uh, well, us feel, feel sometimes good, but uh, I think we, we need to do this. We need to tell them that uh, they should do something about TPP. And uh, I, I think there's a golden opportunity in front of us. I don't think US is going to grab it, but the uh, APEC meeting at San Francisco. So I think we will make every effort to make an appeal once again to the United States to think, rethink their attitude towards CPTP. And if it helps to get US back to CPTP, why not to establish uh, some cooperation, some sort of relation between European Union and CPTP? which will create a huge economic group. I'm sure the U.S. will be more um, uh, interested in getting that CPTP if we do that. Uh, this is uh, just uh, what Japan has been concluding with, uh, in, in the area of security with uh, most of the countries. So I, I think uh, in terms of the arms sale, we have concluded all the necessary arrangements with most of the countries need it, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, protection of uh, uh, confidential information with the Somia and uh, the arrangement necessary for joint uh, exercise AXA, uh, we, we need to do some, something a little bit more. Sorry, I know it's been that I spent 30 minutes, so I'm sorry, Valerie, but uh, this is what I, I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Ishii. Oh, now, uh, before uh, I have quite a few questions on the, um, to your provoking in some ways uh, presentation, especially vis-à-vis uh, -vis France or maybe the EU. But before that, I will uh, give the floor to uh, Klaus Wheeler uh, to make his uh, presentation. Please, Klaus, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Klaus, you are muted. Yes, yes, yes. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I feel encouraged that you want to hear what I'm saying, Valerie. That's good. So um, I've been asked to speak about engaging the ASEAN countries, the concept of common values, 
uh, but Ambassador Ishii has also largely commented on the geopolitical context, so I will also try to outline my view on this. Of course, when we are speaking about values, uh, we always have to be aware that uh, this is a construct in our mind. Like, by the way, national interest is also a construct in our mind. Reality as such is not accessible. But dependent on which concept we choose, we determine our own view of the world. Uh, we either go for attitude, that's values, or we go for the constraints, that's interest. The truth is that we probably have to define where's the overlapping area where values and interests are coming together. And uh, on the issue ASEAN and the European Union, we can approach this from three angles. First, uh, everybody on its own. How is the EU on values? How is ASEAN on values? And secondly, or thirdly, what do we share? The European Union is a union of citizens and states and clearly based on values. They are in our treaties, which is our kind of constitution. And if you deviate in a serious way from those values, you can even be excluded from the European Union under Article 7 of the treaties. ASEAN has chosen a different approach. It is extremely diverse, uh, as we can see when we look, for example, at a country like uh, Myanmar. So the question is, is there nevertheless something which we have in common between the European Union and ASEAN, which we could understand as common values? I would like to mention three. First, a conviction that territorial integrity is crucial. And when we look at the recent United Nations resolution on Russia's aggression against Ukraine, you could see that the bridge towards what has been called the Global South, but I agree it's a very diverse area, that the bridge was possible uh, when resolutions were tabled which tried to defend territorial integrity there is a large consensus that territorial integrity has to be maintained. And uh, I was um, um, very impressed by some of the African countries taking the floor who are permanent members of the National Security Council, uh, saying that, look, uh, you cannot argue that we have minorities in the neighboring country and therefore we have to aggress if we will apply the same principle to our borders in Africa, which are largely drawn by colonial powers, uh, there would be no end to war and to crisis. So there we clearly have something in common uh, across uh, the regions with ASEAN, but also with what has been called here the Global South. Secondly, and very obviously, we both believe in regional cooperation that regional cooperation is at very, very different degrees of maturity. That's true. Uh, we started much earlier in the European Union. We now have uh, more than 70 years of integration uh, behind us. ASEAN started later. But nevertheless, we believe that it's not just uh, a national setting that's important or that can solve our problems, but we need regional cooperation. And the third area where I think there is something in common which we can call interest, but which we can also call value, is a belief in development. Uh, there is a strong urge for development in the ASEAN countries, but also the European Union is very much engaged for this aim. All of these three are nevertheless threatened now and they are threatened by external actors. What is the challenge? When you have a look at the European continent, you, or at the map of Europe, you can see, at least that's my conviction, that the West and the center nowadays is structured by the European Union. 
not everybody is a member, we have 27 members, but even those who are not members of the European Union are drawn into strong contractual relationships. And even the United Kingdom, which left, is now entering into a process to re-establish contractual relationships. They have done that already with Horizon, so uh, research, uh, but we can be sure that over the years to come, additional ones are coming. Switzerland is very closely linked, so we can see that the European Union, in fact, is structuring this space of 440 million citizens, but then going beyond, and of 27 countries, and then going beyond. In the East, we have a different uh, approach. Russia is trying to impose, again, the rules of empire. So the conflict we are seeing in Europe is basically about the rules which should structure cooperation in Europe. We have the idea of the Union of Citizens and States, which is based on law, on free access, but you can also leave, uh, which is protecting the nation state and complementing it where it is too weak. And in the East, we have another attempt to empire and colonialization of neighbors, something we were all involved in in the 19th century, but which we wouldn't like to see come back in the 21st. In Asia, so on the other side of Eurasia, because when Americans are looking at us, they are not seeing Europe, they are not seeing Asia, they are seeing a big landmass called Eurasia. So on the eastern side of Eurasia, called Asia, we have a major conflict coming up, uh, led by China and the United States. The structure of that conflict is not very dissimilar to the structure of the conflict in Europe before the outbreak of the First World War. You have an up-and-coming industrial power building a major fleet challenging the established power. Before the outbreak of the First World War, the up-and-coming industrial power was Germany, and the established power was Great Britain, and Great Britain was not very happy in seeing a huge fleet-building program of the, uh, of the Kaiser. We are now having a very similar structure of conflict in Asia with an up-and-coming industrial power, China, challenging the established power, um, the United States, and having started and is continuing a major fleet-building program. I'm not saying that the outcome of this conflict will be necessarily the same, but it's a clear warning that this is absolutely a possibility and therefore we have to prepare for this. This means that security and therefore also prosperity in Eurasia is threatened on both sides. On the Western side by Russia trying to reimpose the rules of empire, and on the eastern side by China challenging uh, the uh, dominance of the United States and trying to enlarge its area of influence, potentially also with military means. And the issue of Taiwan is critical because if Taiwan would fall, also Japan would no longer be, uh, would no longer be secure. So, um, we are to a certain extent, therefore, in a similar situation. We feel threatened by Russia uh, and in Asia, uh, China is representing a major challenge and that could become a driver for cooperation. Mm -hmm. The aggression of Russia has also changed the European Union. During that aggression, EU and NATO de facto have become complementary in the area of security. NATO has a traditional toolbox of military hardware, but in times of weaponization of everything, which means refugees have been weaponized, energy has been weaponized, food has been weaponized, the European Union has become a necessary complement for security in the European Union. 
and it wasn't NATO that passed these uh, sanction packages. It was the European Union that passed altogether 11 sanction packages and of a severity that has never ever existed before. Uh, but I would go beyond. The European Union will also be the necessary precondition for a more potent defense on the European continent. Without a proper production of armaments, we will not be able to provide the security we need. That's clearly in the area of European Union competence. We allow for the moment an exception to the internal market for armament production, which leads to a situation where probably we spend 30% too much. If we were to have European-wide uh, procurement procedures, or at least more multinational procurement procedures, we could save a lot of money, which would allow us to uh, keep up with our commitments much better. The European Union will also be decisive in the capacity for transport and logistics. Because if there's an outbreak of, conf of conflict, let's assume, for example, the Baltic states, it will be absolutely mission critical that the support arrives there quickly enough to make a real, to make a real difference. For this, it is decisive that the railroad, railroad connections functions properly, that bridges and um, uh, bridges and motorways function properly, and that's something typically which can be financed by European Union programs. We also have to be careful to not fall too far behind in research, because if we cannot compete in the level of sophistication with the United States, joint defense will become more and more difficult. It will therefore be necessary to have a European Union DARPA that bundles our research activities, and that's in the area of European Union competence. And last not least, former Commissioner Michel Barnier did propose, under the presidency of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, a European Union civil protection mechanism, uh, which I think is urgent and could complement what member states are doing. So I expect that in the next legislature, uh, the Commission, besides the top three priorities, which it has now, which is geopolitical, uh, also uh, climate, very important, and digital, I hope and I expect that we will see a major effort on defense, especially if Ursula von der Leyen is continuing, who has a strong background, having been the defense minister in Germany, and understanding very well that the European Union here could be complementary. Uh, in Asia, we are seeing in very short time the build up of defensive security structures. It's not NATO, but nevertheless, if you add up Quad and AUKUS, plus the recent tentative understanding between Japan and South Korea, we start to see structures developing which could be very helpful uh, to uh, contain the challenge. Uh, maybe just as a piece of information, uh, but in my time as Secretary General, I proposed, uh, and we have uh, gone there, that the European Parliament should also be represented uh, around the world. Uh, we have an office in Washington, we have an office uh, with members of our own staff of the Parliament in New York. Uh, we also uh, have now staffers with the African Union in Addis Ababa. And as of the 1st of January, we will also have a number of staff members headed by a director of parliament in Jakarta for ASEAN. That means that also on the parliamentary level, we try to establish a structure, structural linkages around the world uh, to help uh, our common efforts. So, to uh, conclude, uh, EU and ASEAN are both regional organizations. They are, of course, very different. They are very different in the level of integration. But we have common interests which are in our territorial integrity, in the principle of regional integration, in the development. And we are both facing major external threats.
which can be a driver to work much more closely together. I also believe uh, that uh, the traditional transatlantic cooperation we have in many, many forwards has to be developed into a trilateral cooperation between the European Union, United States and Japan. And we should think of institutionalizing formats to bring this further, maybe starting with dialogues on how do we perceive security threats and what can we do about and uh, in my current role as uh, chair of the Academic Council of the Martin Center, which is the political foundation of the European People's Party, I'm very happy to uh, contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Klaus. It's uh, extremely uh, interesting and uh, deep uh, presentation that you made, and I thank you for that. And uh, now, uh, again, I ask uh, people in uh, the virtual room, uh, do not hesitate to make your comments and uh, ask questions through the two and a half. And uh, bottom uh, button at the bottom of your your screen. And meanwhile, I will maybe uh, come back briefly to both presentations and ask uh, make some remarks. Um, I will start with yours, uh, Klaus, uh, because uh, well, I feel very it has been extremely interesting uh, to me. I'm not a specialist of the EU, as you know, much more on Asia. And uh, I have two uh, questions or remarks. Uh, in your conclusion, you mentioned uh, common interest, actually, as a basis for uh, deeper cooperation between the EU, uh, Asia ASEAN, uh, the US, uh, uh, common interest very much uh, focusing on security and perceived uh, threats. And um, actually, this is the point of the debate we have today about uh, shared values or common values in relations with uh, groupings, like a uh, very diverse grouping with like ASEAN. It's the same if we enlarge and not focus only on the ASEAN, but as we did before on the global south, the difficulties of using the concept of shared values or like mind i mean shared values as a specific to like-minded countries when actually the reality is a shared or common perception in terms of security and interest so do we still need i know about the i mean the genetics i, I mean the eu is based on values as you mentioned initially but it also can uh, hinder the capacity we have to play a role towards a certain country who are only interested in a shared security interest and what we can do in that field much more than in all exporting or values or whatever. So this is a, a question. I have uh, maybe for you uh, just a remark also related to what you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, the you know uh, security arrangement uh, in uh, East Asia, uh, of course different from NATO. But you mentioned AUKUS and uh, uh, security relationship between South Korea and Japan. What strikes me in this arrangement, be, beside all the bilateral security arrangement, of course, with the US, US, Japan, US, uh, Korea, and other countries, uh, is in a way the fragility of these partnerships. Uh, relation between Japan and Korea today is much better than it used to be. But it is very much related to the personality and uh, position of the new president, uh, Korean president, uh, Republic, president of the Republic, uh, and his new uh, willingness, personal willingness to improve relation with Japan, including in terms of security. But this is very fragile. And um, after, I mean, we do not know what would happen to this uh better relation between Korea and Japan if there is a change of uh, power at the top uh in Korea for instance 
so it's a constraint of democratic relation in a way <laughs> on, on strategic partnership is important and uh, with AUKUS. Uh, one of the big question mark, but the big question mark is not only for Asia, it's also for the EU, of course, is what about the US after next election? What about if a uh, personality like uh, Donald Trump is re-elected? Uh, what about the uh, tendency of the US to refocus on its own internal interests? And this is very traditional in a way in the US. Uh, rather than uh, taking care of the problems of the outside world, as long as it is not perceived as a direct threat to U.S. interest. Uh, so I think this is a, a big question mark. And another question mark, but this is again more a comment, and we can discuss about this, is China is playing, as I mentioned in the first uh, roundtable, a very important role and very influential because of its com of its perceived economic might on the way it can uh, pour money uh, to support regime in order to gain uh, support for its own ambitions and strategy. And this, of course, there are limitations. But one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, what will happen if indeed China's economy is, uh, as we see this year, for instance, uh, China economic is not recovering that well, and it already uh, impairs China ability to invest. And uh, China's investment, uh, outside investment, has been uh, very much reduced uh, in the last year and the year before after COVID. So uh, what will happen if we see uh, China with diminished capacity to act with its uh, traditional economic might? Would it turn to more aggressive? Uh, military uh, willingness to impose its will, especially in its own region. This is also where we, we, we may question, uh, including the fact that there are a lot of uncertainties apparently inside the political power in China today, even though we do not know a lot about them. So it's a little bit far away, but these, we, these are remarks. As for the presentation uh, by uh, Ambassador Ishii, uh, it's, it was extremely in, interesting, but again, as uh, it's related to my precedent remark, when you say that uh, ASEAN countries have already chosen, yes, in terms of perception, China is a major actor for many countries in the region for different reasons. But again, what about if China cannot play that role uh, anymore? I mean, of purveyor of easy fundings for regime uh, that uh, rely on China in order to improve their own uh, uh, support. Um, and again, I will ask to you the same question about, uh, you know, uh, values and like-minded countries, isn't it too redu reductive? I don't know if it's an English word, but uh, uh, when you deal with uh, countries that do not belong to the same uh, framework in terms of uh, perceiving, perceiving themselves and, and, um, and, um, and so maybe quickly, uh, or quickly, not so quickly, you have 10 minutes. Uh, you can maybe answer these two questions as uh, we do not have for the time being any any other questions. Thank you. Uh, maybe we will start with you, Kalaus, and then uh, Ambassador Ishii. Uh, we cannot hear you. Yes, yes thank you, Valerie. Uh, I've tried to argue that I that we have to think values and interests together. Because if we just think values, we have shortcomings. But if we just think interests, we also have important shortcomings. So what does it mean in practice? Um, we are based on values. The European Union is based on values. And that means that our closest partners will necessarily be those who more or less share our values. And uh, that's why we have the transatlantic partnership for more than 70 years now. And that's why also I think Japan uh, is uh, uh, maybe the first address for us in, uh, in Asia, uh, because it's a well-established democracy, which means uh, governments can change uh, and so on. Uh, 
So US, EU, Japan, uh, and I would also add South Korea, that fits our interests, but it also fits our values. And because it's fitting both, I think that has to be the hard core of uh, our uh, cooperation. Uh, India uh, is very important. Um, and as Secretary General of the European Parliament, I've started regular staff exchanges with the Indian uh, Lok Sabha. We had every year before COVID about 25 Indian staffers coming because for India, the European Union is quite acceptable. Uh, it's neither the United States, nor is it China, nor is it Britain, which has a colonial relationship passed with India. So the European Union can play an important role in India. And in fact, I will go to India uh, end of uh, October, and I also uh, have given a number of talks at the Nehru University in India uh, through digital means. Um, but our strategic reflection has to be institutionalized between those who share core values. Um, in my former role, uh, I've supported and advanced something called ESPAS, which is a strategic reflection on global trends. And uh, I've proposed to move to, to develop something which is called ISPAS, so the same thing internationally which necessarily should include the United States, Japan, and from my point of view, also South Korea, to have a similar a worldview, or at least uh, understand why uh, others are maybe uh, developing a different, uh, a different approach. Um, what is key, I think, in Asia is, uh, and that's the difference to Europe, that we have worked in Europe very, very hard on our past mistakes. Uh, especially the Germans, uh, which, uh, let's say, has allowed deeper levels of cooperation and integration than, than it's the case in, in Asia. So the, your second question was, what about um, strategic uh, autonomy or better, how do we prepare? Um, I am a strong advocate for European Union strategic autonomy but my understanding of this is that this should provide us with the capacity to deal with external shocks. For me, it's not an ideological concept. It's the question, what do we need to do to be able to absorb external shocks? One of the external shocks we have just been living has been Russia's aggression against Ukraine and basically uh, the complete undermining of our uh, energy uh, uh, deliveries. Um, if ever there would be a military confrontation uh, or aggression of China against Taiwan, the shock we would need to absorb would be much bigger because our economic uh, interlinkages between the European Union and China are much bigger. And that's why we are now speaking about de-risking uh, de-risking globalization, uh, but also being aware that the risks in the transatlantic relationship have increased because dependent on now who is winning presidential elections, we have a very different approach on, uh, on Europe. And therefore, strategic autonomy in, in the sense of shock absorption capacity is crucial. Um, the um, integration in Europe and these kind of decisions are always happening in the European Council, back to the wall, looking into the abyss. And in the area of security and defense, that's not a very good advice. Uh, you need 10 to 15 years to develop capacity. So I hope that the Russian aggression against Ukraine has been sufficient uh, to really uh, make the European Union advance in security and defense uh, and defense policy. And concerning China, um, I think it's important that we stick to the one China policy, but we also have to communicate very clearly uh, that this means that no military means are applied to change the status quo. Um, I'm a German, uh, we had German unification, but Germany always took the engagement to not try to change the status quo uh, 
in Europe with military means. So peaceful reunification, if that's supported by both parts, is fine. Uh, therefore, we shouldn't challenge one China policy, but we also need to communicate to China very clearly that uh, doing this with military means uh, cannot be accepted. Thank you, Klaus. And uh, one one comment one comment on your on your presentation. I think I, I agree with almost everything you said, except for one. That is, uh, you said Europe is facing the challenge from Russia. Japan is facing with the challenge from China. No, Japan is facing with challenge from uh, China and Russia. Mm. Nowadays, we increasingly, increasingly see the possibility if China starts doing something. He will be, uh, China will be joined by Russia and North Korea. So our challenge is uh, much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, another thing I support, support strongly about what you said is uh, trilateral structure. I think that big triangle, I, I think there, there aren't so many pillars in the world when you look around who are both able and willing to support the uh, value uh, and the interest you, you're talking about, or the rule-based order and so on. And those are Europe, Asian democracy, and the and North American countries, right? So it's crucial for us to establish close enough coordination among these three pillars. So it is very important to institutionalize, and we should do it somehow. And then this relates to uh, Valerie's question about fragility of the system based upon personality, right? Where will Korea go after President Yoon? I think um, the rationale in our mind to structure an institution like Japan, US, Korea is while understanding that there will be a change, we are democracy, right? There will be a change of administration sometime in future in Korea, which will bring about a swing back to the progressive side. But try to make the swing. You cannot stop the swing. Try to make the swing as small as possible. For that, I think institutionalization is a key. So when the, when the administration, Korean administration, is ready to join us, let them join as many institutions as possible. I say even including Quad, as I said, uh, to make the swing smaller. So that that is a way to deal with the. the more difficult part outside of, of the democracy. Now, how to deal with uh, weak China, right? I think one question is, uh, I think, although I agree with you that China is in a serious economic uh, trouble, I think uh, our assessment of the future of China's <coughs> economy is much from between extremes. I, I think they will muddle through somehow, I think. In other words, we will not see a series of collapses of those, uh, uh, you know, construction companies because they cannot afford it. So I, I think strange, but they have means to support those and make them survive in spite, in spite of the real problem they are facing. So I think problem is they will continue to face with the problem, but they will not collapse. So I, I, I think. Uh, we should not underestimate the uh, power and the uh, intelligence of the Chinese government in terms of controlling the economy. So that's one thing. Second is uh, your question, weaker China will become more aggressive or less aggressive? I would argue less aggressive. I, I think, uh, you know, if you become more aggressive, you will be under more sanction from, uh, from abroad, which will do uh, more, more damage to your economy, and uh, I don't think they, they are in a mood of uh, facing with more difficulties coming from outside. And then uh, if they fail in dealing with those uh, threats coming from outside, I think it, it's going to be as serious enough to start trigger the, the as I said, the, the collapse of the Communist Party itself. So, so I think they'll be really careful. If we succeed in telling them that uh, don't, don't do it, if you do it, you will fail. So I'm not that much afraid of a weaker China, sort of becoming more volatile and then aggressive. I think that's more a sensitive question, right? 
Thank you very much, Ambassador Ishii, and to uh, Klaus uh, Weller also for two very interesting and stimulating presentations on the good dialogue between the two of you. And uh, now uh, we will uh, open the uh, round table number three, uh, focusing on uh, Africa. And uh, you mentioned that yourself, Ambassador Ishii, uh, stressing the fact that uh, maybe the EU should focus more on Africa rather than in other <laughs> regions in the world. We could debate about that. But anyway, we have do not have time right now. We can come back to it uh, during the third uh, roundtable. So uh, we have two uh, speakers for this roundtable. First, Ms. Uh, Sayoko Wesu is from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. She will make the first uh, presentation. And I thank you uh, very much, uh, Sayoko-san, because I know that you are a perfect francophone and uh, you have to speak now in English <laughs> uh, in order to fit into our global uh, global uh, role as uh, FRS. And then uh, your presentation will be followed by the presentation by uh, Dr. Jenna Boussis, uh, who is uh, from uh, Foundation for Strategic Research, also uh, working on African affairs. And I'm looking forward with a lot of interest to your, both of your presentations, because as you all know, uh, friends, and not only friends, but African and the Sahel is facing a lot of turbulence these days, and it can challenge the role uh, other countries or groups can play in the region in relation with the concept of global south. So, with um, uh, Sayoko san, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for your very kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, I switched okay. off my mic, but I can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Sayoko Isu, a researcher in Japanese university. Uh, I grew up in France, Kuwait, and Finland, and have been working for African countries for over 30, uh, over uh, uh, 25 years. So during this, France and Europe have been always an important hub for me, or generally for Japanese working for Africa to help deepening the understanding on African countries. So I would like to thank the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique for this very kind invitation. I'm really honored to be a part of this interesting and timely discussion with you and the participants. Well, uh, today I will talk on how Japan has been assisting the Sahel, North and West African countries in collaboration with multiple partners, including France, let me start by explaining the basic orientations of Japanese policy toward Africa. It is concretized in the TICAT, uh, Tokyo International Conference on African Development, a forum to demonstrate Japan's commitment to African development. It was launched in uh, 1993 when big powers, interest, and support for Africa had been declining after the end of the Cold War. Since its installment, the ticket had been gathering all the key actors every five years, but recently become every uh, three years, to discuss and support the key pillars for stability and development. And this August, I assisted the ticket a 30th anniversary event organized by the Japanese government with a wide participation from the private sector. A lot of issues were raised. But the major take is that the TICAT was the first international forum to stress and incorporate the importance of the African ownership and the international partnership in African development. Well, having said that, I will now enter to, to uh, today's focus. Uh, people keep asking me uh, why Japan has been engaged in the fight against terrorists in Africa. As Japanese ter uh, territory had never been the target of such attacks by the African Islamists. In fact, we started our commitment after the attack on the gas plant in the Sahel in January 2013, where forward, where 40, 40 people 
including 10 Japanese engineers, were killed by the group of terrorists circulating between the Maghreb and Northern Mali. This incident was a big, a big wake-up call for the Japanese government. We can say that the African problems became also our problems. So following the incident, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs quickly announced on the new three pillars of foreign policy consists of strengthening measures against international terrorism, support for the stabilization of the Sahel, North Africa, and Middle East regions, and promotion of exchange and dialogue with Islamic and Arab countries. So since the Ticket 5 in June 2013, much has been provided on the border control and the capacity building for the security sector, including the provision of Japan-made uh, security materials, uh, like biometrics, vehicle for security forces. Well, and then in September 9, uh, 2019, the government launched a new approach for peace and security in Africa, uh, that we call the NAPSA. So the NAPSA aims to address the root cause of conflict and tourism by supporting the institution building and support initiative led by Africa towards stabilization or stabilization of conflict area, including the mediation and, and arbitration led by EU and regional bodies. Along with the changing nature of threat and vulnerabilities, international assistance has evolved from a muscle a militarized approach to support the local population. But there is also attempt to widen the scope by addressing the economic aspect of the borderland, of the, of the fragile borderland. Uh, for instance, uh, a new borderland project, Trade for Peace in Lipteku Guruma, has been uh, implemented with a financial contribution of Japan. Well, such evolution is also reflected on the outcome document of the latest Ticket 8 held in Tunis last year. Previous declaration and action plans gave much focus on humanitarian assistance for refugee and displaced people. So I'm glad to see that the importance of community empowerment is now included in the latest major pillars. I feel that Japan is now committed to peace and stability in a more proactive manner. Well, uh, let me add that among this assistance, financial support for organizing the Dakar Peace and Security Forum since its launch, launch in 2014, a rather unique. In collaboration with France and Senegal, the contribution and active participation in the forum allowed Japan, as a new actor in the security uh, sector, uh, to show its strong commitment to assisting the security development nexus in Africa. It also helped Japanese policymakers and experts to strengthen networks at various levels and to understand the multi layered and complex nature of the threat that the region faces. Well, um, and why the global media now keeps reporting the situation in Ukraine in its victim. The number of victims and refugees in the Sahel and West Africa has passed over unnoticed. Some vulnerable conflict early in Africa, now they are becoming a place for proxy war among big powers. Against such backdrop, what can Japan do? Uh, firstly, creating economic opportunities for youth is vital. And the ticket action plan highlights the provision of technical and vocational trainings to train the defectors and youth under employment. At the same time, the recent research from an African think tank revealed that there is no uh, linear connection between vocational training and future job security. And it feels this program as set up to respond to the underlying socioeconomic realities that make people vulnerable to being recruited by extremists. In the Sahel, where most of the fighters are rural, they come from rural and have different backgrounds, we should start by assisting their, integra their reintegration into the community or help, or help create an enabling environment so that the transnational community can circulate safely. Well, 
Then Japan also highlights assistance to strengthen the government capability, especially at the local government level. However, in the Sahel, government services are mostly absent in the comfort from borderlands. And furthermore, and furthermore, uh, local government agents are not uh, sometimes trusted by the local population, uh, especially in rural areas. So while the Ticket Action Plan highlights the role of prevention, mediation, and arbitration at EU or regional levels, I think a more flexible cooperation framework with, is with NGOs close to the local communities uh, is also encouraged. Um, for instance, several side events or informal meetings were organized by NGOs or research institutes during the Decal Peace and Security Forum, uh, gathering the key actors to discuss hot and emerging issues. Uh, I know that it is a time and money consuming process, but under the current unstable and hostile environment, such dialogue would help ease the tension among the party concerned. And our European countries are supporting such dialogue by sharing important lessons learned from the Sahel. It would serve to agree uh, on a set of concrete actions to stabilize the, com uh, the communities and to establish an early warning mechanism with local actors. Due to the rapid spread of violent armed actors, um, much technical cooperation and um, assisted uh, assisted by the Japanese expert in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso were forced to scale down or suspend their activities. A such decrease is offset by the increase of grant contribution to international organizations, notably on the border management, prevention of violent extremists, capacity building of PKO and security officers. But from the, for the longer time, Japanese development cooperation needs to consider an alternative way to be back in the field and listen to the voice of the local population. Again, this is the biggest challenge we face, I think. And uh, to conclude, uh, we are now facing the new challenges, uh, especially after the coup attempt in Niger. Oh, and coup and terrorism have increased in the past three years. And in this respect, some African leaders like to highlight that threats always come from outside the country or continent. But I don't think it's a good idea to stake such a narrative. As coup occurred mostly as a result of complex domestic matters, and recently terrorism become more rooted in the local context. I believe that Africa's commitment to stability such as ending the civil war or swiftly transferring to civilian rule is important. Without them, no matter how much the international community tries to provide assistance, it will not be possible to deliver it in the first place. Uh, without the, um, the lack of development would lead to a vicious cycle, making people and countries more vulnerable to external shocks. Um, and to conclude, and when we look back the past decade, many assistance have been provided. But uh, it is time that we need to step back and assess what has worked and not. And I hope the upcoming ticket will also be a place where we, where, where we can sit together with our African uh, partners and discuss with our table. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Sayoko, for your very interesting uh, comments, uh, sorry, presentation. Um, again, I will uh, ask you a question or make some com comments after the next presentation by uh, Jenabu uh, Sise. Jenabu, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me this morning. I mean, friends. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be able to speak to you all today. Um, uh, thank you to Sayoko for this first presentation. 
uh, I feel like our two uh, uh, presentations complete each other rather well uh, because I'm going to focus a bit more on the evolution of the context, um, uh, of the regional context, and um, how uh, and the impact and consequences for France's role in Africa and Japan, uh, Japan's role in Africa. Um, so over the last uh, two months, um, we've seen the crisis in Niger, uh, but before that, it's actually been three years since we've been since we've seen a multiplication of coup um, in um, in Africa and especially in the Sahel. Um, actually, this multiplication of coup um, is rooted in a new regional context um, that is marked first first by a growing distrust of populations towards their elites, uh, following decades of corrupt leadership and lack of governance, and a growing criticism of France, uh, which had been the major uh, player in the Sahel, uh, but, it's, but which is now accused of uh, never really ending its France-Afrique practices. Um, so like I said, after playing a central role on the continent for decades, uh, due to shared history, geographic proximity, other powers, lack of interest for the region. Uh, France has now been experiencing a decline of its influence in recent years, especially in the Sahel. Um, it has been accused of neocolonialism by Sahelian authorities due to its significant military presence, its double standard in dealing with um, the countries of the region, and its economic cooperation, which is, which is perceived by some parts of the populations as inefficient. Um, and Barkhane has been considered to be a failure by many observers in the region, who argue that the terrorist threat has increased after a decade of French intervention. Um, so as a result, France has been rethinking its strategy in the Sahel and reshaping its military presence. And the crisis in Niger, uh, which was uh, the strategic pivot for France and European partners, um, has forced, uh, um, as it has actually struck an ultimate blow to France's inf influence in the region. In this context, Russia has been described, uh, as many observers, has, as a winner of this situation um, because it has been benefiting from French decline and exploiting the anti-French discourse through in informational warfare, for example. Uh, but more generally, the recent events must also be analyzed in the context of growing partnerships uh, diversification. Uh, African countries have been diversifying their partnerships since the 90s and now have the choice between more and more partners. Um, they have been uh, growing their exchanges with emerging powers uh, like uh, the Gulf countries, Turkey, Iran and Brazil, uh, but also with uh, significant powers like China and Russia. And, and their interest um, has mainly been uh, for economic uh, reasons and to a lesser extent for political factors. They have been attracted by Africa's rich natural resources and underexploited farming lands. They see Africa as a new reservoir of cheap workforce. Um, and also they can see the, the potential uh, political influence that they can gain. Uh, from Africa, since uh, they can be they they represent new votes uh, at the General Assembly of the of the United Nations, for example. So all of this reveals many changes at play. The emergence of new generations in Africa that are more and more critical of their former partners, and that and they are more and more willing to develop more equal partnerships. The growing influence of new players in Africa in the last two decades, players who turn more and more towards Africa for strategic goals, and the difficulty for former traditional players like France to serve their national interests while fitting the new expectations of their African partners. So in this context, comparing France and Japan on the continent is interesting 
because one is most experienced is the most experienced foreign player on the continent but is now facing a declining image in part due to its military interventionism and the other japan is a much more discreet partner but benefits from a much more positive image and has been centering its approach on human development so this comparison can shed some light on the comparative advantages of the different countries um so um i i will not go back to what uh, sayoko has already said but indeed the tcad is the linchpin of uh, Japan's uh, action on um, in Africa, and um, it's Japan has adopted a non-military strategy on the continent, emphasizing economic transformation and the development of high-quality infrastructure and human resources. So it's really based on quality growth and human security. Um, also, like Sayoko said. Uh, the uh, Inamenas uh, attack was a turning point for Japan because it's from this moment that Japan has um, getting more and more involved in anti-terrorism in the Sahel. Um, and even though the main focus of Japan's strategy um, in Africa and the Sahel is mainly economic development, um, Japan also has um, a military um, and security component through its participation to peacekeeping operations, uh, its engagement in uh, anti-terrorism, um, also um, its uh, mission uh, in Djibouti with the presence of Japanese self-defense forces, um, and uh, most, uh, more generally speaking, uh, its engagement in uh, being committed to uh, peace in, and stability um, on the continent. Um, so all of that being said, Africa has not really been a priority for Japan, nor is Japan a priority for African countries so far, because Japan's influence and bilateral relations on the continent remain more limited than compared to other countries. Um, the One of the uh, the obstacles to Japan's growing influence on the continent is actually the fact that Japan remains an economic dwarf in Africa. Um, compared uh, compared to uh, the the other countries like uh, like uh, the European European Union, for example, which is uh, one of the first uh, economic partners. Uh, to West Africa, for example, uh, but also compared to China, uh, who's been uh, now the first foreign trade partner of Africa. Um, Chinese investments on the continent contributed, um, uh, uh, go, go up or more, more precisely, um, China represents 16% of total trade exchanges with the continent, 12% for exports, 19% for imports. Um, but China's main interests on the continent are actually securing its sources of supply, protecting its growing number of Chinese expats, and developing the influence of its companies. It has mainly been, uh, for China, about uh, economic uh, interest uh, without too much care of governance and um, and um, of governance issues and development issues, which is actually totally uh, contrary to Japan's uh, strategy. In contrast to Chinese strategy, that Japan is committed to good governance, pr uh, to promoting human rights, democratic uh, principles, healthcare governance, and food security. Um, so um, it's interesting to see that the rivalry with China has also contributed to shape uh, Japan's African policy um, in Africa, um, and um, it um, and and we and Japan's has actually um, pro, um, imposed itself uh, in Africa as uh, an alternative mode, mo model to uh, Chinese uh, strategy in Africa. Um, so in this, uh, rather than competing with China, Japan is trying to provide um, um, a more sustainable and uh, peace-oriented alternative to what Beijing has to offer. 
Um, so in fact, Japan has many comparative advantages um, when we talk about um, um, its involvement in Africa. Um, first, compared to France, um, Japan's relationship with Africa is way less emotional than the relationship uh, between Africa and France, like we've seen over the summer, for example. Um, J Japan is willing, um, I mean, France um, is um, has been the country with the most unilateral military interventions in African countries. Um, and in the last years, uh, as a result, it has become the perfect scapegoat for African countries uh, because it uh, because of its military interventions and because also of uh, measures like the CFA franc that is con considered by some African populations as one of the many reasons for African countries' impoverishments. Um, so French military involvement has ending up overshadowing the rest of its action on the continent. And as a result, France has become inaudible in growing parts of Africa, despite having the means and experience to contribute to economic and social progress. So for France to be able to regain influence and improve its image, the country will have to mourn its past relationship with Africa and to completely rebuild and invent new ways to cooperate with Africa. On the contrary, Japan has a much more positive image on the continent because it's neither a colonial power nor a power with hegemonic ambitions like China or Russia. Um, it's, um, it, it, it has assertive, um, it, it, because of this, um, um, its approach focused on economic development, um, it is um it, it benefits from a more positive uh, image and it also has a, a lower military footprint co compared to other uh, powers um and in this um in this light um it is its approach is positive um and japan is willing to develop its local footprint and to improve training of the youth and doing so it has comparative advantages with both china and france um, because compared to uh, China, uh, Japan can offer um, a, a better quality of investments. Um, Japan does it in line with international standards, uh, democratic principles, and um, to uh, Tokyo applies international standards on infrastructure financing, and it um, also focus, focuses on investing in human resources by providing training to African countries instead of exporting its workers like China does it. Um, but Japan lacks the means for its, amb for its ambitions. Uh, and that would be my conclusion. Um, the Japanese struggle the, to stay involved more than two or three years on a project which is insufficient for training local professionals uh, for the long term. The private sector still lacks, uh, the Japanese private sector still lacks interest for Africa. Uh, and contrary to China, Japan cannot force uh, companies to adopt an African strategy. And finally, its lack of economic power in Africa remains um, a major obstacle to its influence on the continent. The, we can say that the most positive image or purest intentions are not enough to develop strong cooperation without the necessary economic investments and networks. And let's not forget the fact that the cultural um, and, langu the, and language barriers uh, that exists between Japan and Af African countries will make it very difficult for Japan to develop strong local fo footprints in the long term, uh, but also to understand better local expectations in the long term. So despite strong potential, Japan's influence in Africa is still a long-term game. However, given the complementarity of the of the approaches between France and Japan, uh, both countries would benefit from working together on the continent. They already have uh, a joint uh, action plan. 
but uh, in this new context uh, where we see the rise of China and Russia, um, and when uh, new generations of African now have uh, different uh, uh, needs and expectations towards uh, the rest of the world, um, a greater cooperation between France and Japan in Africa would actually be beneficial to better feed the needs of their African partners and to better counterbalance the rise of China and Russia. Uh, one uh, key aspect would be the work with uh, civil societies. Because given the distrust of local populations towards their elites, uh, working with, this, uh, with the civil societies of African countries would be key um, in the future cooperations with the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jinabu, uh, again for your very deep and uh, complete presentation of the issues. Let's take a few remarks. Uh, I will start with your presentation, but it also it's also, of course, related to, to Japan. Uh, you are very right to stress the fact that uh, one of the impediments that uh, Japan has in impl implementing better cooperation with Africa in terms of economic terms is, of, of course, related to the nature of the system where Japan, just like other countries, uh, democratic countries, uh, cannot force their own co companies to invest uh, in uh, in Africa, uh, uh, in the framework of the TICAD. TICAD is very interesting. And by the way, it started before China was interested in Africa. And China, in a way, imitated TICAD with its own uh, framework, uh, biannual, I think it's biannual meetings with Afri in order to invest, uh, encourage investments in, uh, in Africa. So uh, Japan has been leading the way in terms of Asian interest in Africa. Uh, India is also playing a role now, but it's interesting to see how I, wo I worked a lot on Africa and China on Japan almost decades ago. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, it, it gives you the long-term perspective of how um, initially Japan was uh, very active in Africa for uh, many reasons in order to also improve, as you mentioned, its traction at the UN, because for Japan also, uh, in in the in taking into account uh, Japan's ambition to achieve a reform of the Security Council, Japan, uh, African countries were important, and it, Japan, China also has been interested again in Africa, um, in, under Mao, there was a rivalry with the US and the Soviet Union that was a focus of China's interest in African countries. Then the rivalries with uh, Taiwan, but now it's uh, completely gone almost because Taiwan lost uh, all its uh, partners in, uh, in, Af in the African continent. Uh, but also I remember in 1996, uh, when uh, China relaunched its uh, policy uh, towards Africa, Africa, one of the arguments openly made was it's at that time, I don't know many countries, but let's say uh, 54 votes at the UN. And it is still extremely important for China to get these votes and to try to work on the elite uh, in order to get these votes at the UN on different issues, uh, sensitive issues for for China. So I will have maybe uh, questions uh, to Sayoko or remarks. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, human security, quality infrastructures uh, in the frame, uh, framework of the TCAD, uh, technical uh, tech training, you know, vocational training, uh, technical cooperation, all this in the framework of the uh, TCAD uh, action plan is all very good and well, and it relates to the shared values that we mentioned earlier. However, um, it's extremely difficult to sell this when the decision making is uh, made at the top without uh, too much uh, focus on governance, as you said, uh, Jenabu, uh, and that it's extremely difficult to compete with China in terms of 
easy disburse, disbursement of fundings, as uh, some people say. I mean, corruption also plays a role uh, in elite relationship between China or uh, Russia is a different issue, but uh, uh, China on some governments in Africa. And even if you focus on civil society, I think civil society has a lot of expectations, but uh, in terms of decision making and influence, the role of uh, elite and uh, uh, official authorities is such that it's extremely difficult to compete with a country like uh, China, even though some of the countries in the region can also realize the difficulties they are in with in terms of debt, for instance, or, or bad, suddenly discovering what it means to be too close or exclusively close to China. Um, and the second uh, remark or question is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the role of uh, Japan uh, is uh, important and different from the one, I mean, there is a complement complementary uh, uh, factor between uh, Japan and France. But in the situation where, especially in the Sahel, the security situation is degrading for the time being at least, uh, it's a question also to Sayoko. Do you think that uh, Japan can uh, still be present in uh, these regions? Uh, when the security and the political stability is so uncertain. So maybe I will uh, ask Sayoko to comment on my comments and also on Jenabu's presentation, and then I will ask uh, Jenabu to do the same. Sayoko-san, the floor is again yours. Okay, thank you very much, Fari and Jenabu. Uh, especially of Jenebu's comments is so, um, so pertinent and I have so much comment for on her. But let me uh, focus on valid questions on law of Japan, uh, especially in the Sahel. Well, I, I heard that the JICA, Japan International Cooperation, Cooperation Agency, has just um, made um, Sahel strategy uh, to foster the development cooperation uh, in the Sahel, in the Sahel, but uh, this was uh, decided just before the uh, the coup d'état in Niger, and I heard that they are now rethinking the, uh, the the cooperation strategy for the region. So for me, it is very difficult to comment. <laughs> um, what can Japan do um, under uh, such? Um, instable situation, but the um the point is that the, the Japan is um certainly less dynamic compared to China or other uh, big powers or major powers like Gulf. But, um, however, Japan has been uh, always providing a uh, basic assistance like uh, um education or health or uh, local governance uh, local gov uh, local governance issue uh, so our part our presence in uh, in the region uh, will not be very dynamic for the coming years because of the difficult security situation and we uh, we will have another uh, channels as uh, some uh, third party uh, uh, training in the like in, in another countries in in Africa or maybe in France or in another location, and partnership with a local uh, civil society as Geneva has uh, proposed is also an um, important way for us to uh, consolidate our cooperation or partnership with the Sahel uh, with the Saharian countries. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, I I totally agree. And to what to add to Sayoko's comments, um, I would say that um, is well the the security challenge in in the Sahel is actually uh, the big uh, um, um, dilemma and challenge for um, uh, powers cooperation because 
uh, on one hand, uh, people um, people say that it's important to be involved in the region uh, for it to be more secure. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's difficult to be involved in the region because of the insecurity. Um, I would say that uh, in any case, uh, uh, presence is influence. So if you're not present in the region, you're not going to be influenced, influential. And if you're not present in the region, you're not going to be able to improve the security of the region. So I feel like um, all the countries really in the world, <laughs> uh, not just Japan and France, but also the European Union, the United States, um, uh, uh, should remain involved uh, in the region because leaving would be uh, the perfect way to uh, for the region to actually uh, fall fall off. Um, that uh, that being said, um, like I said, um, now for France, uh, France had been uh, betting everything almost on uh, the military aspect because it was almost one of the last symbols of its hard power and of its uh, uh, perception as a great power in the world. Um, um, hence, uh, the numerous uh, military interventions um, in Africa. Uh, but now, um, uh, these military interventions are more and more uh, perceived in the region as a symbol of um, uh, the, the continuation of colonialism. So it's not possible anymore for France to rely so much on the military aspect. So I feel like France should uh, be inspired <laughs> by Japan's uh, focus on human-centered development, because even though France has, of course, a development uh, policy and a strong one, um, it it was overshadowed by the military components. Um, so um, that's why I think that uh, the decline of France uh, in the region uh, should uh, encourage France to work more with uh, other partners uh, like Japan, uh, like India, um, um, uh, of course, the European partners, because uh, it would be a way for France to not be at the forefront and uh, as a result to not uh, be the focus on all this criticism. But they will, uh, but working with partners, they will still be able to do the necessary work for the region. Um, and I feel like that in the multipolar context of today, um, most countries should benefit from this approach. And I, and, and I feel like that uh, whether it's the European Union or France or uh, India, uh, all these countries really have comparative advantages to uh, Russia and China because Russia is mainly uh, concerned about um, arms exports and is no and is in no way concerned about uh, governance and um, and peace in the region. We saw it with Wagner, and uh, similarly, China is mainly concerned about its economic interest in the region. And a lot of African countries have realized it uh, following uh, the criticism on the loan policies. So um, I I feel like that on the long on the long term. Um, there are uh, really a lot of comparative advantages for uh, um, uh, France, Japan, uh, India, the European Union, um, and leaving would actually uh, be uh, the it, it will lead the region to uh, a disaster. So um, it's important to remain active, and I think it's important to uh, be more low key. <laughs> Uh, low-key approaches um, uh, with uh, more uh, on the ground, less uh, top to top, less elites to elites, and more civil society to civil society. So yes, it's uh, on the in the short term, it's less sexy. <laughs> it's more. Uh, um, it, it doesn't seem like uh, there's a lot of uh, prestige. But actually, in the long term, it would be much more beneficial for the countries.
but it we have the countries have to uh, um, realize that it will take time uh, and and that's actually the difficulty for France today it's because it's realizing that it's losing influence but rebuilding influence will take maybe decades uh, but for that uh, they will have to go back to the roots and and working at a much lower level. Thank you, Jenabu. <clears throat> as you say, as, as you said, that uh, yes, indeed, uh, leaving Africa uh, would be a disaster for the countries in the region. And I think that one of the things that we are, in a way, paying now. But I want, I don't want to make generalization because situation is very different depending on the countries and so on. And so Africa is not, you know, it's uh, <laughs> very diverse, as we all know, and uh, it would be much more um, useful to 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 take it countries by countries or groupings by groupings. So. Uh, it's very different, but this is true that uh, after the Cold War, as I mentioned before, there was a, a global disinterest for uh, Af the African continent, and including, as I mentioned, from China initially, because China was very much focused on its own uh, development or reform and uh, economic economic reform, and uh, starting at the, in the 1979 until the beginning of the 1990s, uh, where there were has so much to do in uh, in China, plus the fall of the Soviet Union that led to the fact that it was not that important for China anymore to focus on gaining influence in, uh, in the, on the African, African continent. So that came back later in the mid-90s, and as you mentioned, because of economic interest and access to resources, plus political support on the international um, uh, stage, it was important for China to rebuild uh, its relationship with uh, with Africa. Uh, with symbolic, for instance, China uh, always uses very symbolic move like the first trip of a Chinese leader every year should be in Africa or on the African continent. So these things are a way to demonstrate uh, the interest they have for the, for the region. Uh, plus, of course, paying for big project and so on and it's as we mentioned before very difficult to compete in this field because uh rules of in terms of governance openness and so on is much stricter in what can be done from a democratic or you know the west plus japan it's uh, much more uh, difficult so i don't know if uh klaus Vela, klaus are you still there I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, because it would have been interesting to have an input from uh, the EU, or not officially the EU, but from from someone with a uh, hello, Klaus. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was just asking if you could just uh, put a very short input as we have uh, a little bit more time on, you know, there, there is indeed uh, uh, Africa and the, uh, I mean, cooperation with Africa, I think is part of the uh, dialogue we also have with Japan. So in terms of uh, triangular uh, dialogue between uh, on Africa with Japan. Do you have a few things that you could input in order to enrich uh, discussion we just had or? Mm -hmm. um, not much to be honest, but it's clear. I mean, I've been accompanying the president of the European Parliament over the last 14 years uh, to meetings of the European Council, uh, to be more precise, to the first half an hour, because then the prime ministers prefer to meet without us. And it's uh, obvious that Africa has gained more importance, more weight over there. But I found very interesting what your um, colleague had to say. Uh, basically, she is saying that if we want to preserve uh, a good role in Africa, uh, we have to, um, let's say, we, 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 we should not be under the suspicion that this is continuation of colonial activity. So the European Union could be, I think, a very good framework uh, in which to, to do things. Uh, I've also seen this, you see, in Latin America, um, if, if this is focused on Spanish, uh, you know, it's maybe more difficult than we have a more a broader variety. 
if uh, uh, the policy towards Ukraine is basically done by Central Eastern Europe, that uh, has also its limitations. So I, I, I think this uh, thesis is uh, fruitful to think about how can we reframe our relationship and make it clear that uh, this is not a kind of post-colonial uh, activity, but something that is in the mutual interest. Thank you very much. And uh, just to, to, to go on a little bit of this remark, uh, you are very right about this, uh, not only the historical colonial past, that, uh, which is a fact, but also the way it can be used by certain interests uh, in some countries in order to build a disagreement and uh, you know, focusing on other. It is also related to all this talk we have about propaganda or disinformation, as we mentioned it now. And there is a, 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 a historical fact, this is true, but this is all, there, there is also the way it can be be used today. And this is also true, for instance, for Japan in its own region, uh, where when I mention relations with South Korea, of course, uh, there is a colonial past of Japan in South Korea. This, there is also the way some political parties in South Korea are using it in order to go on with constantly going back to the past in order to prevent Japan to play a more uh, important or normal role uh, today. And this is, of course, even more true in the case of China, where the Communist Party in China is using uh, that argument constantly uh, in order to put down any ambition by Japan to play a more important role in its region or to punish Japan also uh, for its uh, special, I mean, strategic relationship with the U.S. when tensions are important uh, with the U.S. So uh, this argument is very true, and uh, playing together with the EU is a way to go around that kind of argument that is used by some countries. I don't maybe think I could maybe I could add one more uh, thought. Uh, traditionally, we have been thinking that Russia is the problem of the eastern member states of the European Union. But if we have a look at the map, um, the, invention in, the intervention in Syria of Russia was a, had a major destabilizing effect on the European Union and on its political system. So there we are already in the southeast. And uh, what Russia is doing now in the, in the south, uh, especially in Africa, I think is making it clear that Russia tries to destabilize us all around, uh, in the east, in the southeast, and in the south. And I think that has important policy consequences, because whereas maybe, uh, let's say some years ago, the perception was this is a local problem, maybe for the Baltics or for the Polish, I think we now have to understand that uh, we are destabilized both in the east and in the south, and therefore countries like France or Spain are as concerned by Russian destabilizing activity than the uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Thank you very much. Did Sayoko San, Jenabu, do you have anything to add to, to this or a last <laughs> comment? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much. I learned a lot from all of your uh, intervention and comments. Um, so I would like to keep uh, of a conversation uh, after the after the meeting. Thank you. Yes, indeed we did. Jenna Bud, you want do you want to add something? Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, let's uh, let's keep in touch. Um, uh, just yeah, um, when you mentioned that uh, Japan was leading the way, uh, it's actually a very good point because um, Japan with Tika, Japan it was the first uh, time that a power a foreign power was doing an international forum in Africa, and everyone imitated Japan afterwards. It, then it was, France, it was only in 1996, and then China in 2006, and then India in 2008, and then uh, the US in 2014, and Russia with uh, the Russia-Africa Summit in 2019. So I feel like it's um, it's important to, to, to remind it because, um, there's been so much focus on Russia Africa summits, uh, and I and and I feel like this media focus um, is representative of Russia 
narrative power, <laughs> how they manage to spin the narrative and make it so that they're the main uh, partner in Africa. But when we look at the facts, they're also an economic dwarf. So I feel like even though there's a lot of concerns regarding Wagner, um, I feel like there's still a major uh, um, um, initiatives to play for European partners and Japan because uh, Russia doesn't have the economic power or will to invest in in Africa. And I feel like on the long term, it's going to be detrimental to their rise on the continent. So um, I don't think we we should be afraid of, uh, uh, I mean, we, we should be afraid of Russia, but not too much because we, uh, we, uh, we have like the Western partners in Japan, we do have comparative advantages. And um, I feel like the more Russia is going to be involved in on the continent, the more African uh, countries are actually realizing that uh, they're not that good of partners, <laughs> and they're seeing it now with with Wagner and the, and all the the attacks on civilians. Uh, they're seeing it with the lack of investments. So um, Russia was it was a, a good temptation for Africa because it's a way it was a way to reject former colonial powers but they're also uh realizing that um uh, they're not the perfect partners so the african partners will still rely on uh, other uh, players than russia okay thank you very much uh, jenabu so we will close uh, the web conference here and uh, I want to thank all the participants for following our debates and also, of course, all of our speakers. Uh, let's, uh, as it was mentioned, let's keep in touch and go on with this uh, dialogue. Thank you very much to all and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>